thank you very much for this kind invitation. It's really a fantastic seminar. And it's always great to be the 100th speaker. It's my first ever time being the 100th speaker at any seminar. So I'm very honored, thank you. So um, I, I work on uh, kind of the interface of ergodic theory and number theory. And so uh, recently there have been a number of results uh, having to do with the uh, values of homogeneous polynomials and quadratic forms. And so uh, my aim today is to give you some kind of exposition of uh, these re recent results. So I like this area a lot because uh, it uses a lot of machinery from different parts of mathematics, like ergodic theory, the geometry of numbers, the analytic uh, methods, and also that uh, it seems essentially to be very widely open. So there are a lot of interesting problems. And so I hope I can uh, interest you in some of them. All right, so I'm just going to scroll because that seems to be the best uh, way forward. Okay, so um, we're going to begin with a very classical theorem, which uh, everyone, uh, all of us have seen at some point. It's a theorem of uh, Mayer, and it can be found, for example, in Serre's book on arithmetic. And it said that if you take an indefinite rational quadratic form in at least five variables, then this has a non-trivial integer solution. Right, so this uh, is a very nice uh, and, uh, theorem, and it's a consequence of the Hasselman-Karski local gradient principle. All right, so uh, this is very nice. Now, um, one can wonder what happens if you look at quadratic forms which are uh, not rational. Right, so uh, this was uh, you know looked at by a British mathematician called Oppenheim. And he made the following conjecture. And he said initially, so he said, let's take a quadratic form which is not a multiple of an integer form, right? So we we'll call such a quadratic form irrational. And let's assume that it's indefinite and non degenerate. And uh, so he was trying to match it with uh, Maya's theorem. But, and so he first conjectured this in five variables. But later, it turns out that three is enough. So under these uh, hypotheses, uh, the conjecture was that the quadratic form takes a dense set of values at integer points. Okay, so uh, what we have is that if you have a rational quadratic form, then it has an integer zero. If you have an irrational quadratic form, then you can approximate zero uh, as well as you like using an integer. Value. Okay, so that's the that's the philosophy behind the conjecture. And uh, here's an example of a, an irrational quadratic form. It's just uh, any quadratic form, which is not uh, an, a multiple, a real multiple of an integer quadratic form. So uh, Oppenheim conjectured this around uh, the year 1929. And uh, so this is what I mean uh, precisely by uh, rational quadratic form. So if you take a rational quadratic form and you have a multiple of a rational quadratic form, then it's very easy to see that uh, the set of integer values it takes is a discrete subset of the integers, right? So it's some constant multiple of an integral form and the set of values it takes will be a subset of this multiple times the integers. So the conjecture, uh, at the time conjecture dichotomy was that rational quadratic forms correspond to a discrete set of values and irrational quadratic forms correspond to a dense set of values. So following Oppenheim's conjecture, uh, okay, so I should first uh, mention why the three variable con condition in the conjecture is uh, crucial. So it turns out that this is not true in two variables and it's quite easy to cook up counter examples. So let's see one quickly. So what you do is you take a two variable quadratic form uh, where you cook up this alpha to have the right diaphragm properties. Namely, you choose it to be a quadratic irrational. And these numbers, as we all know, turn out to be badly approximable by rational numbers. And so uh, one can use the property that they're badly approximable by rational numbers to make sure that the quadratic form uh, stays away from zero. 
Okay, so not only is the conjecture false in two variables, in fact, it's uh, now known that uh, if you look at uh, the space of all quadratic forms, there's a, a full house stuff dimension worth of counter examples to organize conjecture in two variables. Okay, um, there's an ergodic uh, reason for this failure, which I'll come to uh, in due course. All right, so uh, following Oppenheim's conjecture, there was a lot of work in the number theory community uh, using analytic methods. So the results of Chawla for diagonal forms in at least nine variables of Davenport and Heilbronn, of uh, Davenport and Redoubt, and uh, so on and so forth. And so at some point, I think, the, the conjecture was known for all forms in at least 21 variables. Right? So this, uh, the time that I'm now talking about is we have moved from the uh, early 1930s to uh, the late 70s, early 80s. This was the situation at that point. So at this point, I have to make a remark that in fact, Oppenheim's conjecture is it suffices to prove it in three variables because you can restrict the quadratic form to a suitable rational substance and prove the conjecture. So the hardest case and the only really, the only case that is uh, uh, needed to be proved is a three-dimensional, three-variable case, okay? All right, so then uh, what happens in uh, the late 70s or early 80s Someone, uh, it's not, I've tried to find out who this person was, but it's not here, was giving a talk on the Oppenheim conjecture at the Tata Institute where I work. And uh, Raghunathan was in the audience. And when he saw this conjecture, he realized that this can actually be turned into a statement about a group action on some probability space. And so he made a conjecture to the effect, which was equivalent to Oppenheim's conjecture. The story then goes that Margulis learned of uh, Raghunathan's uh, conjecture and how it relates to Oppenheim's conjecture. And Margulis then proved Oppenheim's conjecture by proving the ergodic state. So now in the first part of my talk, I want to explain how uh, a statement about quadratic forms has, uh, what it has to do with ergodic theory. And once I explain that, I'll go on to the more recent developments. So what is the probability space that we're working with? So um, the, the space that we're working with essentially is just the space of co-volume one lattices in Zn. Okay, so this is basically just Z in Rn. So this is basically Zn and also Zn multiplied by matrices in SLNR because we want them to preserve the volume of the fundamental domain, okay? We want them to be unimodular. So SLNR has a transitive action on these lattices and SLNZ is the stabilizer of the lattice Zn. So one can identify the quotient SLNR factor SLNZ with the space of unimodular lattices in Rn, this is a finite volume quotient. So the hard measure on SLNR descends to a finite measure of this quotient. And this is going to be the probability space that we're going to be interested in. All right, so uh, what is the dynamics? So essentially the dynamics is just uh, action by translation of subgroups of SLNR on this quotient, okay? So it's easy to describe as algebraic, but it's surprisingly uh, rich and complicated. All right, so uh, Raghunathan made the following point, a uh, very important uh, point, that Oppenheim's conjecture would follow from the following statement about the dynamics of a certain subgroup on this quotient, namely, One takes, if you, if you take a quadratic form in three variables and take its uh, orthogonal group, call it SOQ. So Q is the quadratic form, SOQ is the orthogonal group. 
Then SOQ is a subgroup of SL3R, and therefore it has an action on the quotient SL3R factor SL3Z just by left multiplication. That's it, right? And so what we have here is a nice uh, finite volume non-compact space on which there is a group action. And uh, Oppenheim's conjecture would follow, as noticed by Rabbanathan, from the statement that any orbit of this group acting on the space uh, falls into one of two categories. It's either closed and carries a invariant probability measure or it's dense, okay? So if you're looking at, I mean, if you, if you uh, study ergodic theory, you're looking at uh, actions which are chaotic, such as these actions, then this kind of behavior is uh, very, very rigid. It's kind of surprising. So it's saying this is a non-compact group acting on this space. Its action is ergodic. And one, be, one expects a lot of chaotic behavior, but instead one, uh, the conjecture at the time was that there are only two possibilities for this, for orbits. So you can describe all the orbits as specific. Okay, so that's the remarkable thing. So what does this have to do with quadratic forms? Let's try to understand how this is connected. All right, so uh, the point is uh, in this particular case is that the orthogonal group is uh, a conjugate of a group generated by uh, unipotent one parameter set. Right? So it's basically, this group is based essentially uh, SL2R and generated by upper uh, triangular and lower triangular matrices. And so the conjecture that Raghunathan made uh, for the orthogonal group uh, was quickly generalized to a very general rigidity statement for actions of groups generated by unipotent groups. So there's a background to this, which is uh, in the 70s, there were some beautiful results of Dani and Reach and Fussenberg about the horocycle flow on the modular surface, and which provided evidence for this kind of rigidity. So, in the background of these uh, results for the order cycle slow and these uh, connections to quadratic forms, we had a, a very general conjecture by Raghunathan in the topological category and a corresponding result, a conjecture by Dani in the measure category. So the conjecture in the topological category said that the orbit closures of these group actions are very specific and have an algebraic origin. And the measure uh, conjecture by Dani was that the ergodic invariant measures are very specific and have an algebraic description. Okay, so uh, when Margulis saw this uh, reformulation of Oppenheim, he proved this particular instance of Raghunathan's conjecture. And uh, in general, of course, as is uh, well known, the in full generality, uh, Raghunathan's and Dani's conjectures were proved uh, by Marina Ratner in a phenomenal landmark work. All right, so this is some history. Now let's see how one can relate values of quadratic forms with their body theory, right? So consider the quadratic form Q0, which is simply x squared plus y squared minus z squared. And uh, let Q be as in Oppenheim's conjecture. So Q is some irrational, indefinite, three variable quadratic form, okay? So we're going to write Q in terms of Q naught. So Q can be written as some lambda times Q naught uh, composed with uh, G, but G is some matrix in SL3 R. all right? So the stabilizer of this quadratic form is just going to be the conjugate of SO21 by this matrix G. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the orbit of SO21 acting on the coset G gamma. So this G, uh, the coset G gamma, this G is the G which comes along with the quadratic form, okay? I have one fixed quadratic form, I'm writing another quadratic form in terms of this quadratic form. Uh, and this G depends on my quadratic form Q. So the dynamics is 
the SO2 one action on SL3R factor SO3Z. And precisely, I'm interested in what happens to the coset G gamma when I act by SO2. All right. So let's see what happens. Now, according to Margulis's theorem, there are only two or two cases. It's either going to be dense or going to carry a finite invariant mesh. So let's look at each of these cases in turn. If the orbit is dense, namely if Hg gamma is dense in G, then uh, what happens is that when I look at the values uh, of Q at integer points, this is just simply by definition, the values taken by Q naught at uh, G gamma Z3. All right. Now, since H stabilizes, H is a stabilizer of the form Q naught, it's the same as the values of the set Hg gamma Z3 or Q naught, but this Hg gamma Z3 is dense. And therefore, this uh, is the same as the set of values taken by G Z3, which, of course, as we know, is all of the real number. Okay, so I'm missing a couple of uh, closures here. So there should be a couple of closures. So it's, this, this equality should be uh, interpreted a little bit liberally. It means equal to the closure of this. Okay, I missed out the closure, I'm sorry. So that's uh, what it is. So if the H orbit of this coset is dense, then as you can see, it's quite easy to check just by continuity arguments that uh, in fact, the quadratic form takes a dense set of values. The other side of it, namely if the other alternative, if the orbit is closed and carries an SOQ invariant probability measure, is also easy to understand. So in this case, what happens is that it's a fact that in this case, uh, gamma intersected with GAG inverse, the conjugate of H by G, is a lattice in GAG. Okay, so it's a discrete subgroup with finite co All right. And there's a, a very uh, uh, nice theorem called the Borel density theorem, which then tells us that the stabilizer of the orthogonal form or the quadratic form is then contained in the Zariski closure of this lattice, which means that the stabilizer of the quadratic form would have to be uh, algebraic, an algebraic group defined over the rational numbers, which is only, which is impossible if the quadratic form was an irrational form. Okay, so this is how it works. Uh, there are only two possibilities in the, on the ergodic side of things, either you have a dense orbit or a finite volume uh, orbit, uh, a proper finite volume orbit. And one of them corresponds to the rational quadratic form and the dense one corresponds to the irrational quadratic form. Okay, so uh, this is the basically the end of um, the first part of my talk, where I'm trying to give you some indication of how ergodic theory might enter into the study of quadratic forms. So the message that I want to uh, kind of offer you to take home is, uh, essentially that uh, one can study, uh, one can learn a little bit about quadratic forms by looking at how their stabilizer acts in the space of lattices. And then uh, study some dynamics of this action and try to translate this information back and forth on the earth, from the arithmetic to the dynamic side and vice versa. All right, so that's the basic idea. All right, so uh, now I come to the second part, uh, the more recent part of my talk, which is, um, so we were all, everyone was very happy when Margulis proved his result, uh, because uh, uh, of course it proved Oppenheim's conjecture, but uh, ergodic methods uh, satis, you know, suffer from a kind of historic uh, deficiency, so especially when compared to analytic methods, Ergodic methods are often not effective, all right? So this is uh, currently, I, I would say, one of the bigger challenges in ergodic theory, which is to prove effective versions of uh, all these, of Ragnar's theorems and things like this, all right? So 
what, a, what, what does one mean by an effective version of Oppenheim's conjecture? And how would one go about uh, approaching this? So uh, what I mean by effective in this talk is a very simple thing. Um, Margulis uh, told us that uh, given uh, I can approximate zero by an integer vector to uh, as great an accuracy as I like. So now the question is, uh, where do I look for if I want to find this integer vector? In other words, if I want to solve the inequality Q of X less than epsilon in integer vectors X, can, is it possible to get a bound on the size of X in terms of the quadratic form say, right? This is a very natural question and uh, the, approaches which, uh, I mean, the circle method and analytic approaches always give bounds to problems such as this. Ergodic methods don't so far. So um, this part of the talk is about some recent work where uh, people have used a variety of uh, techniques, new techniques, to try to get a handle on this question. Well, the first uh, very important result in this was is a 2040 result of Linden Strauss and Margulis. And uh, they proved a uh, very beautiful theorem which said that for an explicit set of irrational quadratic forms in three variables, you can find uh, integer solutions to the inequality qx less than epsilon. And uh, furthermore, X can be found in a ball of radius roughly uh, e to the one over epsilon. Okay, so this is a, a very uh, important theorem uh, because it's explicit. So they give a diaphantine condition on the quadratic form, and for that full measure, or for that set of uh, quadratic forms, uh, they proved this explicit result. And this was done basically by uh, a very complicated uh, somehow uh, improvement of uh, results of Margulis and Dani Margulis, which they made effective. And uh, it's, it's a very important, and very difficult uh, paper. So, um, the question one might ask uh, when, when, when you look at the results, which is this, is so what should one expect? So this is a very good result, but is this bound really what one should expect? And can one do better than this? And uh, oftentimes in uh, arithmetic, when one has a very difficult result with a bound, what uh, what you can try is to see if uh, you can get a better bound by trying a random version of it, right? In other words, if I settle for less than the Strauss Marcus, namely I give up this expectation of having an explicit description of the quadratic forms for which my bound holds, but instead try to prove a result for say a full measure set of quadratic then can I do better? Okay, so this is what uh, was looked at uh, by myself in joint work with Alex Korodnik and Amos Lino, where we proved that for almost every three variable quadratic form, uh, you can solve this inequality with a much better bound. So the bound now is uh, X is bounded, it, it can be found in the radius uh, in a ball of radius one over epsilon, so it's better by uh, an exponential. Okay, and in a certain heuristic sense, this is the right bound to expect because if you look at uh, you know lattice points in a ball of radius t, they're in in uh, three dimensions, they're roughly uh, t cubed of them, and you plug them into a quadratic form which takes values in some uh, interval of, uh, you know, of roughly size t squared. So you'd expect the, the least one to be roughly size one over t, okay? Heuristically, 
And so what we were able to prove is uh, that, uh, in fact, this is true for almost every polarity. Okay. So uh, it's a much better bound than Innistrad Margulis, but it's uh, an almost every bound. There's this much stronger result because it's an explicit set of international polarities. In fact, uh, in the work with uh, Grodnik and Nemo, we have uh, many more results of this kind. Um, so in fact, we prove a result which is true for quadratic forms in all variables, but the, the quality of the result is not, uh, is somehow uh, is a little bit, uh, it, it uh, deteriorates a little bit as the dimension goes higher. Uh, on the other hand, it kind of uh, provides uh, effective statements for a lot of similar uh, diaphantic inequalities on homogeneous varieties of semi simple groups. All right, so let me briefly explain uh, how we went about this. And so uh, basically, uh, as we saw, the Oppenheim problem could be translated into some problem about the stabilizer of the quadratic form acting on uh, the space of lattices. And this is the same idea over here, but somehow uh, here, uh, a different facet of the stabilizer is being used. So as we saw, uh, the Oppenheim problem can be uh, translated into a problem about the gamma action on the quotient G mod H. And similarly, the effective Oppenheim problem translates to a quantitative equidistribution problem. One then turns this quantitative equidistribution problem around by um, instead uh, looking at so this is, this is something called a, a duality principle, which is an uh, old and very, uh, very fundamental principle in dynamics. So you turn the problem around from uh, looking at the gamma action of G mod H to the H action of G mod H. And here, uh, somehow, the fact that this stabilizer is a semi-simple group is uh, what is the most important thing. So in uh, Margulis' solution to uh, Oppenheim's conjecture and in Ratner's theorems, the, the fact that uh, really is drawn out is that the stabilizer is generated by unipotent one parameter subgroups. But here, what one uses is somehow the spectral nature of the group action. So one wants to look, so what we do is we look at the harmonic analysis of sensor. And the reason for doing so is because uh, one knows going back to the work of Nevo and uh, Nevo and Stein uh, that in fact the action of semi-simple groups on homogeneous spaces uh, it admits uh, ergodic theorems with rates. Okay, so this is the beauty of uh, semi-simple groups. Uh, in Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, which is the ergodic theorem that everyone studies, uh, there's no rate of convergence. But if one acts by a bigger group, like a semi-simple group, one can in fact get very good uh, rates of convergence. And of course, in the last decade, this, uh, this kind of thing has been used to a very uh, good effect by Korodnik and Nevo in counting lattice points and by Meister, Grodnik, and Nouveau in diaphantine approximation problems. So let me briefly explain what kind of statement one has. Uh, so uh, it turns out that this subgroup action on G1 gamma leads to a unitary representation on L2 of G1 gamma. And then uh, one can consider an averaging operator. So you should think of this as a time average you know, in the Birkhoff recording theorem, you have a time average along an orbit, and the theorem says that almost surely this converges to the space average. And so here, this is similarly an average over bigger and bigger balls in the acting group. And mm -hmm. uh, yes. Sorry, please excuse me. There is a, um, a few questions from Sergei Konyagin. Sergei, would you like please to unmute and ask away? I have two questions. The first question, 
we say uh, about a set of, uh, of complete measure of coup, is this set explicit or not? And the no, so in, in, in our, uh, uh, it's not explicit. Ah. It's not explicit. It's not explicit. Yeah, not explicit. explicit. And, the, and the, uh, the theorem of Ogrodnik at Nev says that for almost all Q, do you understand correctly, and for sufficiently small epsilon, this inequality holds. Yes, the theorem of uh, myself, Grodnik, and Nevo says that uh, if for a full measure set of quadratic forms, yes. you can find x and z in such that qx is less than epsilon and x can be found in the ball of radius yes, 1 the, over the epsilon is sufficiently small. Yes, epsilon is sufficiently small. Already sufficiently small epsilon, yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. Is it okay to continue? Yes, please finish. Okay, Sorry for interrupting. Thank you for the question. All right, so basically, uh, I just wanted to say that the main tool here is an ergodic theorem, which uh, comes out of this eight action on G mod karma. And uh, one looks at these kind of averages over bigger and bigger balls in the group. And then uh, there is an ergodic theorem which says that. Uh, these averages converge to the integral of the function over G mod gamma. Not only uh, do they convert, they converge at certain explicit rate. All right? So this rate comes out of the harmonic analysis of uh, H. And uh, the beauty of it is that uh, it's, it can be computed. So sometimes it's not very easy to compute it, but it can be computed. And uh, it matches up so that uh, in this three variable quadratic form case that uh, Gorodnik, Nevo, and I were studying, the rate uh, matches up so that it gives you exactly the answer uh, one over epsilon up to a small perturbation of the power. All right. So, this is basically the idea of proving uh, effective Oppenheim conjecture, one way of proving effective Oppenheim conjectures for almost every quadratic form, which is to use the fact that uh, the acting group uh, has uh, frequently has some uh, very quantitative ergodic theorems attached to it. All right, so uh, at this point, I make a small digression to introduce a uh, work of uh, Burgan. So a reformulation of uh, Margulis's result uh, is the following. So, Namely, one can reform it to say that there are sequences uh, n going to infinity and delta going to zero, such that for all sufficiently large k, this inequality holds. So you can approximate the real number c using uh, q, uh, uh, you know, applied to integer vectors in the ball of radius k. Okay, so this is just a reformulation of uh, Oppenheim conjecture. And Burgan considered this reformulation and asked, well, uh, another way of making this effective would be uh, to uh, understand the quantitative relationship between the sequences n and delta. Okay, so uh, here is this theorem uh, to be precise. So he considered the diagonal quadratic forms, uh, uh, namely forms of this kind. And then he proved that, uh, assuming the Lindelof hypothesis, that uh, this inequality holds uh, for, a fixed, for a fixed beta. He fixed one parameter and let the other parameter vary. Uh, and almost all alpha, as long as this precise relationship holds. So as long as nk over uh, k to the eta delta k squared goes to zero. Okay, so this is a kind of, uh, a uniform version of effective Oppenheim because uh, in the, the statement that I made uh, about the theorem of myself, Boronik, and Nevo, uh, we were approximating a point uh, uh, C in, in the real line, but in, in principle, the full measure set of points could depend on this point. The full measure set of quadratic forms could depend on this point. Here, uh, there's a uniformity in the, in the full measure set. So this is a beautiful result of Burgan. And then uh, Kelmer and myself 
uh, uh, prove the result uh, using erotic theory, which is the same as Morgan's result, but holds for almost every three variable quadratic form, not the diagonal forms, right? So Morgan was averaging over a smaller family of quadratic forms. We proved the same result for almost every quadratic form. And uh, recently, uh, Damaris Schindler has generalized Morgan's result to higher degree diagonal forms. So it's a very nice uh, result of ours. So this is a brief digression on Burgan result. Um, all right, so now I want to go back. And, uh, so after, uh, uh, so uh, myself, uh, Gorodnik and Nivu uh, used ergodic theory. Uh, Atreya and Margulis came up with a beautiful idea to attack this kind of problem. And this idea was uh, to use uh, uh, Zekel's uh, moment formula, okay? So, I'll explain what it is a little bit later if time permits. But essentially, uh, there's a famous uh, formula of uh, Rogers, which uh, kind of computes moments, higher moments for uh, uh, in Zegel's mean value form, for Zegel transforms on the space of lattices. And uh, this essentially converts this Oppenheim uh, type conjecture into a lattice point function. And so Atria and Margulis used uh, methods from the geometry of numbers uh, to prove effective versions of Oppenheim type theorems for generic forms. So their uh, methods kind of, uh, so as I said, uh, uh, the work of uh, Grodnik, Nevo, and myself applies to a wide variety of settings. This doesn't apply to as wide a variety of settings. However, it gives you the sort of correct answer in all dimensions, which we were not able to do. Okay, so that's a big advantage of this uh, counting, less point counting approach to generic versions of open IMT theorems. And this was uh, refined and extended significantly by uh, Kelmer and you in a beautiful uh, paper. In particular, they also proved uh, general versions of this result of Burgan that I just mentioned on the previous slide using these moment formulas for uh, Ziegler transforms. All right, so I will try to explain what this is a little bit later, but I want to uh, kind of uh, bring in some recent work. And this recent work has to do with uh, uh, what are known as inhomogeneous quadratic forms. Uh, so just a minute, I have about 15 minutes, is that, is that right, Alina? Um, even see? more if you want. It even more, okay, 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 so take okay, your time, yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right, so uh, for uh, some time now, I want to discuss uh, some more recent work, which has to do with uh, so-called inhomogeneous quadratic forms. And what are these things? So this is a quadratic form with a shape. Okay, so I have a quadratic form, and the fixed vector alpha. And I define uh, what is what I call an inhomogeneous quadratic form, denoted Q sub alpha uh, as follows. It's just Q uh, of X plus alpha, all right? So these inhomogeneous quadratic forms uh, have been around for a while and were studied in a famous work of Sarnak and also a famous work of Jens Markloff, uh, who studied pair correlations and they have to do uh, they have some connection with uh, the Berry Tabor conjecture in um, physics. So, uh, as far as we're concerned, it's natural to ask whether one can prove Oppenheim type theorems for inhomogeneous quadratic forms and effective versions of such results. And this turns out to be a very interesting question. So let's set the conjecture first. So what should be the appropriate conjecture? It has to involve an irrational inhomogeneous form. So what is this object? So if you're going to call an inhomogeneous quadratic form irrational, if it satisfies one of two conditions, the first is that it's uh, either the quadratic form is irrational as we know it, or if the shift is an irrational vector. Okay, so, uh, an inhomogeneous quadratic form can be irrational under uh, two circumstances. Either the form is irrational or the shift is irrational. And if either of these happens, then we would expect that uh, one has uh, 
version of the Oppenheim conjecture. In fact, uh, Margulis and Mohammadi uh, in the year 2011 proved a quantitative version of Oppenheim's conjecture for inhomogeneous forms. And so what does this mean? So this means the following. So set, let's set up a counting function. Uh, this counting function n, which depends on the form, an interval, and the parameter d. And it simply counts the number of uh, integer points in a ball of radius t, uh, such that the quadratic form, uh, uh, when you plug in these vectors to the quadratic form, they land in this interval i. Okay, and so a quantitative Oppenheim problem is the problem of giving some kind of asymptotic formula for this counting. All right, so, uh, and indeed they proved a nice uh, asymptotic result. So they proved uh, a lower bound uh, in uh, three or more variables and actually uh, an exact asymptotic bound in five or more variables. I have to mention this point that this constitutes an inhomogeneous uh, version of some very famous results of Dani Margulis and S.K. Margulis and Moses, who treated, who obtained uh, asymptotic formulas such as these for uh, homogeneous quadratic forms. All right, so uh, this is uh, what uh, was known, and of course, this uh, lower bound of this for this counting function already implies. Uh, the Oppenheim conjecture for irrational inhomogeneous quadratic forms. So uh, now we come to some very basic questions. So uh, namely, can anything be said about effective results for some explicit family of inhomogeneous forms like we were talking about originally? And uh, how does one define uh, almost every inhomogeneous form? Because of course, now there's much more choice. There's the possibility of taking, uh, varying both the quadratic form and the shift, or uh, fixing the quadratic form and varying the shift, or fixing the shift and varying the quadratic form. And so can one uh, get error terms in the quantitative terms of Margulis and Mahmadi? Can one prove effective versions of Oppenheim's conjecture as we've been discussing for this kind of quadratic form. And this turns out to be a problem which is uh, very interesting and by no means settled. So um, I'd like to report on some progress, which is joined with Dubi Kelmer and Shu Chen Yu. And so the, the answer to these questions, it turns out to be quite complicated. And uh, so the first uh, kind of regime one can look at is to allow uh, one to vary both the quadratic form and the shift. And this turns out to be actually uh, kind of the easiest situation. Namely, one can follow the work of Atria Margulis and of Kelmer and you and get a nice bounds for the effective open eye problem if you allow both the form and the shift to vary. The situation changes dramatically if you fix one of these parameters. And uh, also, interestingly, uh, the method of attack changes correspondingly with these two. You know, when, when one fixes one of the parameters. So here's a theorem. It's a little bit complicated, but let me just uh, talk everyone through it. This is a problem where we're fixing a rational shift and allowing the quadratic form to vary. And here uh, we are in a very good situation because we have a nice asymptotic count. So this is a fixed rational shift allowing the quadratic form to vary. We have a nice asymptotic uh, count with a nice error term, with a good error term. And in particular, this count with an error term implies an effective version of Oppenheim's conjecture for these inhomogeneous forms, namely, it tells you that you can solve, uh, you can get a good bound. Uh, this kappa is the same bound that was there in uh, this effective Oppenheim for a fixed alpha and almost every t. Okay, so 
uh, this is the situation. If you fix a rational shift and allow the quadratic form to vary, you can get very good bounds in the counting of solutions to quadratic inequalities, as well as effective versions of inhomogeneous quadratic inequalities. Um, we also have a result for fixed uh, quadratic uh, fixed shifts, which are not rational. But this is not as nice as this result. It kind of depends on doing some Diophantine approximation and uh, approximating this irrational shift by rational shift. So I won't uh, bring that up. It's, it's possible to prove some results, but it's not as good. Um, the second result is a result where you fix a rational quadratic form and allow the shift to vary. And this uses a completely different method. So this method here, I'm going to come to this, this method here is based on this uh, philosophy of Patria Margulis and Kelmer Yu and uses a kind of a higher moment formula, not on the space of uh, unimodal lattices, but on a congruence quotient of less than a half. So I'll try to explain what that is briefly. And this method here uh, uses a spectral technique which uh, was used in the work of Gorodnik Nevo and myself. And here also we have, uh, this is a situation of a fixed rational form and varying alpha where one uses spectral techniques to prove an effective open hand result, all right? So this is uh, what the, uh, the results that we obtained jointly with uh, Duby Kelver and Shu Cheng Yu. So in the rest of the talk, I want to kind of briefly uh, indicate how this uh, approach using uh, higher moments of zero transforms works by trying to briefly explain how one would prove this kind of result. And then I'll end with uh, trying to highlight some uh, more recent uh, work of uh, along these lines. Okay, so basically the idea is uh, as follows. So uh, uh, this, uh, the philosophy is quite uh, simple. So let me just say it. So basically we have a fixed rational shift and what we do is kind of uh, use this fixed rational shift to, uh, uh, to get a hold of a, uh, a congruent subgroup of SLNZ. Uh, so one can do this in, in a precise manner. But uh, rather than kind of explaining everything uh, as it is, let me just say that essentially what happens is uh, looking at uh, counting the number of solutions to this uh, quadratic, uh, inhomogeneous quadratic inequality where the, fixed, where the shift is a fixed rational shift is essentially the same as looking at a counting problem on a different homogeneous space which is a uh, homogeneous space uh, with, uh, by a congruence quotient, okay? And essentially the main tool here is uh, the Ziegler transform. So uh, one, you know, many of us have seen the Ziegler transform on the space of lattices here. It's uh, written down in the space of affine lattices. So uh, essentially you take some uh, compactly supported function on Rn, and form a function on the space of lattices by summing over the non-zero lattice vectors, all right? So this is uh, what is called the Ziegler transform. And uh, uh, Ziegler had a, a famous formula. So let me just ignore uh, some of these technicalities which are written down for the congruence quotient. But Ziegler had a famous formula which said that the average of the Ziegler transform over the space of lattices is the integral of the function over Rn. Okay, so this formula here is a congruence quotient version of that formula. And what we need uh, in order to prove uh, the result that we prove is to compute uh, higher moments of the Ziegler transform. Because higher moments of the Ziegler transform, so the Ziegler trans, the Ziegler's mean value theorem essentially is gives you uh, the lattice point uh, counting, the main term of the lattice point counting problem. So one side is the number of lattice points in the ball. If you apply it to the indicator function of the ball, 
and the other side is the volume of the ball, right? And so if you want finer information, you need to uh, obtain a higher moments. And actually you need to do a little bit more work because it's a kind of a complicated lattice point counting, but uh, um, maybe uh, it's not appropriate to get into that. But essentially you need some uh, second moment formula of, of this kind. So uh, these second moment formulas are actually very useful. They were first, as far as I know, discovered by Rogers, and then they were used by uh, Atreya and Margulis, Kilmer and Yu. And actually uh, there's some very nice uh, moment formulas for orthogonal groups in uh, Shuchen Yu's thesis, uh, which are also uh, have found uh, very nice applications in work of uh, Kilmer and Yu. So uh, essentially in this part, what I want to advertise is that uh, uh, moments of these uh, Ziegler transforms uh, actually are very helpful uh, in lattice point counting problems in a variety of settings. Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, essentially the main thing is uh, to get a discrepancy estimate for a lattice point count using the second moment form. So maybe I'll uh, kind of not go through this uh, whole thing. And I end by uh, advertising some uh, work of some uh, early uh, career mathematicians here at the Tata Institute, uh, which is very nice. So uh, the first uh, kind of series of works I want to talk about is the uh, work of uh, Jiang Han. Uh, she's a postdoc here. And so uh, she's done some a very good work on uh, S arithmetic versions of open algebra. So one can consider uh, uh, isotropic uh, p-adic quadratic forms, or more generally s-arithmetic quadratic forms. And these were actually first studied by uh, Borel and Passat, uh, who obtained versions of Oppenheim conjecture. And uh, uh, Jiang uh, has done a lot of work on this. And uh, recently uh, she has established uh, uh, s-arithmetic uh, versions of these uh, higher moment formulae on the space of lattices that I was just discussing. And uh, also uh, she has, uh, you know, by establishing those, she has kind of uh, obtained uh, periodic versions of this generic effective Oppenheim. And then uh, using her approach, uh, uh, she and I uh, 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 proved some results about uh, moment formulas on congruence quotient. So some analog of uh, the results of uh, myself and Kelmer and you uh, for p quadratic forms. So uh, she has some very nice work. And uh, finally, I would like to uh, advertise another young uh, mathematician, uh, Vinay Kumaraswamy, who is also a postdoc here at the Tata Institute. And so uh, we, uh, in joint work with him, we looked at uh, kind of, uh, uh, so uh, I discussed this uh, result of Burgan and uh, mentioned uh, the work of Damaris Schindler who had uh, looked at higher uh, degree forms. And so uh, it's uh, natural to ask whether one can get uh, inhomogeneous versions of uh, with Burgan's and Schindler's result. And so we were able to uh, obtain some kind of uh, results where uh, essentially we um, fix a shift and allow the quadratic form to vary in some diagonal family like work and did, and uh, obtain some unconditional bounds and some bounds are uh, conditional on the Lindelof hypothesis. So uh, the method of attack here is basically to use, uh, is analytic in, in the style of work. So that's something I didn't discuss, but uh, it's a nice result, so I thought. All right, thank you, I'll stop here.